Hello. One of the most bizarre aspects of human sexual expression is the fetish. Now, why is it that some people are stimulated by the sight, sound and feel of high-heeled shoes, rubber and leather clothing, silk, satin and fur? Are they perverted? Or is this simply an extreme example of something we all respond to? I'm Philip Hodson, and in tonight's edition of Hodson Confidential, these are some of the questions we'll be trying to answer. Now, according to the dictionary, a fetish is any inanimate object which abnormally excites erotic feeling. What the dictionary doesn't say is, why? Now, is the fetish a substitute for normal sex or a trigger for it? Is it all that abnormal? Is the relish for stockings and suspenders enjoyed by millions of people a mild form of fetishism? Whatever the answers, some people have turned fetishism into a cult. Magazines with circulations in the tens of thousands cater for their interest. Clubs exist where fetishists can wear what they like in private. And there are shops selling the goods and clothes that they demand. Shops like Tim Woodward's Skin 2 in West London. Well, it's amazing how many different sorts of people are interested in dressing up in leather and rubber and high heels and whatnot. It covers quite a range of people from young, old. There are people like punks, bikers, middle-aged married couples, rubber fetishists, all sorts of people. We even have people come to our parties dressed as Cruella de Vil or a Scotsman in a kilt, Count Dracula. People of every kind, black, white, young, old. It all started in 83, where people wanted somewhere to come together, some sort of focus point. So a nightclub got going, and then one night at the nightclub, we decided we'd have a magazine. We thought that just we would be the only ones who'd ever read it, so we just printed a thousand copies and sold them to each other and paid the printer and thought that would be all. But now we've produced eight of them and we sell 14,000 of them all around the world, which amazes us. We get subscription requests from people who sign themselves the Reverend so-and-so. We have a bank manager who has it delivered to his bank where he works. And uh, we also have a civil servant who has it delivered to his office. And they've in fact told us, which is nice, that they do that quite deliberately so they don't need to feel, and their colleagues, friends don't need to feel, that they're being in any way secretive about being interested in dressing up. There are three main fabrics associated with fetish fashions, and the first is rubber. These clothes are designed by Kim West. They're very well known. You can see them in Vogue, Elle, and magazines like that. She specializes in the cowgirl jacket, which has tassels on it the way you'd expect, but it's made of rubber. Christina Kitsis, her clothes are called ectomorph. This is the standard fetish icon of a biker jacket, but instead of being made of leather the way you'd expect, it's made of rubber, and it's got silver studs all down the back like that. For comparison, this is the standard leather biker's jacket, the thing you see every day as worn by James Dean, Marlon Brando, etc. The third fabric is plastic. And these clothes are designed by Judy Wilde. They're called Wild Designs. They're fetishistic. Again, you can wear them everywhere, but the difference is they cost quite a bit less, so they're more accessible. This is a classic black cocktail dress, but made in stretchy, shiny black plastic. Looks wonderful. When the Skin 2 Club first started back in 83, I went down there having read about it in the paper just to see what it would be like. As soon as you start chatting to the people, you see the humour which is inherent in this sort of thing. People are having fun, they're enjoying it. And although you might be dressed like a motorcycle cop if you're a man or like a dominatrix if you're a woman, the minute you start to relate to these people in any sort of way, just chatting at the bar, you realise that there's a tremendous spirit of fun in the whole thing. <laughs> Debbie, you work for Skin too, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, are you sitting comfortably? I am, yes. Is that one of your favourite outfits? One of them, yes, one of the many. What does this one do for you? Um, it's a very strong outfit. It's um, a dominant outfit for a woman to wear jobbers and jackets. It's like a, a riding habit, really, but in rubber. And it, it makes you feel? Strong. Strong, yes. in charge? Yes, in definitely. In control? Yes. Taller, bigger? Um, I think when you put it together with high heel shoes, you always feel bigger and it makes you feel a lot bigger in, in your own personality as well. And what's it made of? Rubber. 
and it is rubber with leather boots. That's right, yes. And you wear that, we've seen in the film, to work. You have one of those unusual jobs where you can get away with wearing that to work. Perhaps you can't wear that in a bank. But do you wear it uh, by choice outside work? Yes, I do. Yes, a lot of the time. So, under what circumstances? I mean, going out, parties, or sitting in front of the television? Not so much sitting in front of the television, but going out to parties, nightclubs, um, straight parties even, what I call straight parties anyway, with um, people who wear jeans and T-shirts and things. I, I will choose to wear rubber to those parties. Now, we've heard that it's become part of fashion to wear these fabrics and these sorts of clothes, but for you, is it mainly a fashion thing or is it a sexual thing? It's more of a sexual thing for me. More of a, a sexual thing? Yes, because I was actually wearing it before it became fashionable. So, in a sense, you feel a special pleasure or even a special need to wear this? Um, maybe not so much a need, but I do get great pleasure out of wearing it. I don't suddenly feel, oh, I have to wear a piece of rubber. I have to, I have to. Or I'll die by five o'clock. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really feel like that, but, but I know I am free to wear it when I want to wear it, so I don't have the problem. How old are you now? 24. When did you first venture into rubber as far as you know? When I was 17. You're sure you weren't dressed in rubber nappies when you were about two no, months old? No, nothing like that at nothing all. Nothing like that. No. About 17. Now, yeah. how does a 17-year-old suddenly decide that this is what you really want to be in? Well, I just discovered it with some friends. Some friends were wearing mm. it and I sort of felt it because it was an unusual sort of fabric. Went. Yes, that's right. I that's wanted nice. to feel it, mm. you know. It's, it's very tactile. It and is I, tactile. I, felt it, smelt it, you know, I said, have you got something I can try on? And uh, that was it, like a duck to water, straight like away. Like a duck to water? Or was it more that you recognised that this was going to give you something of yourself which nothing else would? I mean, it was almost part of your identity? Um, in some ways it can be. Um, Did it make you feel it sexy? It makes me into a different person Does it make when you feel I'm wearing sexy? it. Yes, it does. Yes, I mean, you, you feel much. that you're attracting men or you feel more turned on? I feel more turned on in myself whether the men are attracted, mm. that's, you know, I know they watch and they look and they're very interested and some of them are a little frightened and put off by it. Does it protect you from men? Um, yes, I think it does because it makes, you, well, it makes me feel very strong and aggressive towards them and, mm. and I won't take any nonsense from them. Because, I mean, I think, you know, one might think twice about going up to somebody so dressed and saying, you know, can I have this dance? Because it is a bit intimidating, isn't it? It is a little intimidating. Most of them will come up to you and say, what's that you're wearing? They, they question you more than mm. ask you for dances. And what things. did your mum say when you took this up? Um, well, it's my own life, and as long as I don't do anything wrong, she's not particularly worried about it. So you weren't it. thrown out of the house for it? No, no, not at all. <laughs> and what about boyfriends? I mean, has it added to the pleasure of relationships or has it caused problems? Um, it hasn't really caused any problems, no, because uh, I started wearing this kind of thing when I discovered sex, if you like, so it's always been a part of it for me. So no bloke said you're more in love with that gear than you are with me? No, I haven't had that yet, mm. no. Have you ever experienced sex without all this stuff? Yes. Does it rate? Um, well, it's, it's nice to do both, both ways. So you're not knocking ordinary, straightforward no. sexual behaviour? No. And you're not compelled to... I mean, suppose suddenly there weren't shops that sold this sort of thing because the country couldn't afford it, because the oil had run out and we couldn't make it anymore. You'd get by still. You'd be all right. I'd find something else, I think. You'd find something else. Mm. So it's, it's more than fashion, it's part of your sex life. Yes. And part of your relationship with somebody who's also interested and, and enjoys it. And, I mean, do you use it as a straightforward fetish that you touch, or does it become part of a game or a role-playing behaviour? Oh, it's, it's part of a game, definitely. What sort of games do you play, Debbie? <laughs> That's a leading question. Um, sometimes I like to take a dominant role. A dominant role? And I'll dress up in something that covers me altogether, mm. like a cat suit or this, uh, this costume. Mm. Um, or I, I may like to play a submissive role where I'll wear a smaller item of rubber so that more skin is showing and high heel shoes all of the time. Mm. Um, it can be fun just to wear these things and go out walking. I, I like to do that. I like to go out and... Um, I mean, you're sort of showing straight society 
something? Yes, I like, I like to show You're putting people. sort of two fingers up to them? Yes, in a way, I am saying this is what I want to do. And, um, you know, it's nothing to do with you if I want to do it. There, there must be a sense, though, of where does the energy come from to do this, or the need come from? Now, I might be very simple and say, you're trying to show people that you're powerfully sexual. So if you turn it upside down, maybe at a time in your life, maybe when you were, I don't know, an early teenager, you felt not very powerful, not very attractive, not very desired. I'm guess, just guessing. I had, um, I had a time in my, my early teens when all my friends at school were starting to go out with boys and that kind of thing, and boys never seemed to be very interested in me at all. And I used to say to my mum, am I normal? What's wrong with me? The boys don't ask me out. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't have any problem at all now. <laughs> you don't have any problem at all now? Was no. that because you're in a sort of a subculture or a world of your own? Or is it because you're wearing this sort of thing and although it intimidates a lot of men, some men will struggle through because they're so attracted to no, it? No, they will, yes. If they really want to come and talk to you because you're into this kind of thing, they will come and talk to you. There are the ones that will steer clear because they're really very frightened of you. But, um, you know, if they want to talk to you, they'll come and talk to you. And it's not threatening like in a normal nightclub where the blokes will come up to you and start badgering you for a date or a dance or whatever. They're not like that at all in these places. A better class of blokes. Oh, much better. Into, much into better. rubber. And... That's right. I also remember from the clip that you were dressed up in a nun's outfit. Are you into blasphemy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my secret. <laughs> I, mean, I like wearing it. I like the feel of um, the loose latex, the way it rubs against the, the body. It kind of causes an electricity with the skin. But I also like wearing it because I suppose it is a blasphemy. Wearing a rubber nun's outfit is something that is so... So you're somebody who likes to take a taboo and sort of push at it. And you're somebody who's sort of not exactly got a problem with authority, but is challenging official traditional values or authorities in some way, whether it's fashion or whether it's, in this case, religion. Yes, well, I like a challenge. You and like a challenge. Like, and, and that is um, one of the more shocking outfits that I have, because a lot of people will stand back when they see you wearing something like a rubber nun's outfit, because it, it's not a sexy, skimpy nun's outfit, it's full length, it's the full thing, the, the long undergown, the the tabard over the top, the wimple and the mm. veil. What about somebody whose beliefs you may be making fun of, who is hurt by what you're doing? I've never come across anybody who has been. I wouldn't like to offend anybody, but then I don't mix in the circles where there are likely to be those people to be offended. So in a sense you're out of the, the general social swim where somebody might be so offended. And Are you saying there are no Christians who are rubber lovers? Oh, there are. There are. Uh, they, they do enjoy this kind of thing. But um, as yet, I, I haven't, well, not that I know of, offended anybody wearing my rubber nuns outfit. Down to basics. Is it comfortable? Are you sweating? Yes. No, I'm not, I'm not sweating at the moment. And it doesn't give you skin rash? No. One of the nice things about uh, wearing rubber or latex is that you can get very hot and very sweaty in it if you go to a nightclub and you're dancing around under the lights. You take it off and you leap straight into the shower and it feels like you've been in a sauna. It feels very invigorating. It's a nice feel. Over the years, there have been countless explanations of why people are turned on by objects or fabrics. Is the fetish, whether it's a high heel or a silk garter, a substitute for a relationship with a real person? Or is it something which triggers off pleasurable emotions because of its past associations? Now, to help answer questions like this, I'm joined by Lynn Proctor, who's a journalist who's written extensively about the fetish scene, and Ted Polhemus, an anthropologist whose book, Body Styles, came out in October. Now, Ted, if I can first turn to you. Looking at uh, Debbie here, she's wearing a sort of all-over condom. Can we get a sort of a working definition of what a fetish is? Is this a fetish? What is a fetish? Well, for anthropologists, a fetish is any object that has a magical power. In the context that we're talking about in it today, we're talking about a magic sexual, erotic power. Now, there's lots of different theories about this, why this should happen, but I think before we get into that, it's important to distinguish between the everyday kind of normal fetishism, which I th uh, everyone has, which is just a, a attaching certain erotic sexual connotations to objects, materials, fabrics, or parts of the body, 
which one would not normally see in this way. And then on the other hand, to distinguish with the exclusive fetishist, as I call them, who is a person who is unable to become sexually aroused without the presence of their particular fetish. Because in that second category, you've got some people who a lot of others have interpreted as neurotic, as really being stuck, who are in love with a thing, and they can't function sexually unless that thing is given to them. And in that way, that they are a tiny minority, they are abnormal in that sense? They are abnormal, they are a minority. I doubt that they're a very tiny minority. I think there's much more of this than we re recognize generally. But yes, one, it could be a problem in the sense that it could be an unfortunate situation for someone to be in. I think what is so valuable about the sort of thing that Debbie and other people are doing today is in helping to bring fetishism out of the closet, people who have a particular interest in rubber or in leather or whatever are able to meet other people uh, with whom they can form relationships in which they can express this, this interest. So, so the, in a sense, the problem area is helped, the problem is helped. But you also said that everybody has some area. Now, do I understand by that you mean that every mum in the land has a sort of favourite nighty and she's ascribed a kind of sexual power to that piece of clothing? Is that what you mean? Yes. Well, all that I mean is that in the course of our lives, objects and materials and smells and, and whatnot that we uh, encounter in association with, with sexual things can accumulate a sexual connotation which is triggered by the presence of these things. So that all that that really means is that whenever we come into contact with the smell of a particular perfume, the rustle of a particular fabric or whatever, that these remind us, rather like in Proust's book, Remembrance of Things Past, there's the moment where he bites into a biscuit and he's reminded of things in his childhood. Here we're talking about the, the tact, uh, tactile sensations of a particular fabric, etc sponsoring those associations. Okay, so Lynn, if, if I touch your blouse and I, I remember things, um, can I ask you, is, is this something that in your experience happens more with men? Are we talking about basically about men's reactions with Debbie a sort of exception or is it almost equal to both sexes? Oh, well, I think that women are just as fetishistic in a general sense as men are, except of course that women can get away with it. Women can, how, wear, how so? women can wear whatever they like. If a woman chooses to, to wear brilliantly coloured silk or tight leather skirt or whatever, that's quite acceptable. If a man wants to wear brilliantly coloured silk, he's a little bit suspect. Men's dress is so restricted that if a man has a real interest in wearing any particular fabric or shape or anything, then he's pushed outside of the norm. Whereas for a woman, she can still remain within the norm and wear stockings, high heels, suspenders, all these things. If a man wears these, my goodness me, what a terrible thing. So you're saying you believe that we're talking about something universal, but there's a different social reaction to it? Absolutely, yes. Ted, why do people pick up fetish? Well, I mean, why does somebody have a fetish and somebody else doesn't? Well, there's some extraordinary psychoanalytic theories about why this should be the case, and uh, as you may be aware, Freud had this bizarre theory about uh, the fetish as being a, uh, a penis substitute in case one is confronted with the possibility of castration and all of that sort of thing. I find this to be, to be, to be very odd indeed. I think that in the sense that I'm talking about fetishism, there's a very simple explanation, which is we were talking before about the associations that garments or perfumes or whatever have for us. The fetishist seems to be somebody with a very limited range of associations that sex comes to mean rubber or it comes to mean leather and it doesn't tend to mean anything else. Now this could happen because one had very limited uh, sexual experiences at a particular stage of one's life or it could happen because of certain kind of deeper psychological predispositions to sort of cling to and to latch on to a particular thing, or it could come out of childhood associations, I suppose, as well. But why one object, Lynn, rather than another? I mean, why rubber rather than Terry Wogan's blazer or the post office tower or whatever? I think a lot of it's to do with aesthetics, and there are general aesthetics within our society about what is sexual. Um, things that are particularly shiny 
are usually sexual. Uh, high heels are considered by most people to be sexual. Black is sexual. Black stockings are yes, much more sexual. In a way, you're begging the question. I mean, when we were all stomping around in a cave, was shininess sexual? I mean, where did that come from? Um, whatever, whatever any one group of people chooses to see as sexual and labels as sexual, thereby becomes sexual. Oh. So that if you have a situation where people uh, say, put if putting on stockings and suspenders is not done by most people when tights have come in, then by wearing stockings and suspenders, you're saying, this is a special occasion. And the special occasion is being sexy. So that you can take almost any garment you want, and as long as enough people agree it's sexy, it is. Do you share this view, Ted? That there's a kind of democracy? Oh, yes. If enough people vote for something as a sex mm. object, whether it's you know, um, uh, a truss or a comforter or a scarf or uh, an old jacket, anything could become, be, become well, sexual? For a particular individual, anything could. I've heard of one person who has a, who has a fetish about the smell of photocopying machines because mm. he happened to have a sexual, his first sexual experience in a photocopying room in an office. In duplicate? And, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but he smells the, the you know, the, the odors that you get out of a photocopying yeah. machine and bang, that's the trigger of his sexuality. For most of us, however, and for most fetishists, be they exclusive or not, we, live, we all live in a society which assigns certain things the, the title of a fetish or a kinky object or something like that. I wanted to come to the Sun mm. newspaper because you're, you're <laughs> sort of surrounded, aren't you, by tabloid newspapers and one or two others as well, which report certain kinds of stories. Suppose, I don't know, Debbie gets run over, God forbid, on the way home and she's dressed in her provocative gear. And you can imagine how the Sun would report that. And I intend no libel when I say they'd say it's bizarre, kinky Debbie so-and-so mm. is found in the King's Road or whatever mm. it is. Do you see that kind of reporting making the fetish itself a more strong fetish? I mean, somehow stimulating more people to respond in that way, extending it, spreading it, as it were? Yes, yes. Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that that happens. But I think ultimately the power derives from uh, the associations we build up in a, in a personal experiences but I do certainly think that there's this other level of the the social meanings of the, the, to which we ascribe to, to objects and that we share those as a society we can say it's the phrase stockings and suspenders and most of our viewers will immediately connect in their brain with an erotic impulse because, naughty naughty slightly be, kinky yes whatever yeah. We've seen that fashion has now taken up what was exclusively for sexual minorities in a sense, with rubber and leather and the other gear. Are we going to see the poor old fetishist somehow have his special relationship with these materials destroyed? Because everybody's into it. I mean, how can it be exciting and forbidden, hidden, secret and special and new if it's on the bus? Yes, well, well it, it's not very likely to be on the bus, I suppose. But it, Do you travel by bus? It is. Yes, Sometimes. yes, right. so I'm proven wrong immediately. Now, um, it's more likely that we'll see these things in nightclubs and, and situations where people get dressed up in a way. Fashion is always um, ripping off everything that it can get its hands on from Peruvian peasants' outfits through to older fashions and whatnot, and then coming into into fetishistic garments in the 60s it was leather today because leather has become a fairly acceptable mm -hmm. mainstream kind of fabric that's turning to rubber Lynn have you found that fetishists when talking to you as a journalist have sort of complained that the fashion trades muscling in on a special area in general they're, they're very pleased about it because there is this problem of isolation that we're talking about that um, if most fetishists want to find somebody else who's interested in what they're interested in. They're not interested in, in being completely isolated. And although they like things to be naughty and special and have that, you know, th that atmosphere around them, which makes an occasion a special occasion, uh, they don't want to be totally isolated and doing it in their own ro room and worried about you know, having to shut doors and what the neighbours will think. Do, do you welcome the general interest now? I mean, you're sort of promoting the sub substances and the business generally, aren't you? I mean, you're, you must be keen that other people should get involved. Uh, yes, but not everybody. I wouldn't like everybody to be into it because, as Ted was saying earlier on, it wouldn't be so special then because it's nice to be different. Everybody, thank you very much. 
Fetishism is one of those subjects where obviously it's difficult to get hold of information which is unbiased for or against. So we've prepared a fact sheet which has all the details. And you can get it from us at this address, which is Hodson Confidential, P.O. Box 99, Maidstone in Kent. I repeat that, Hodson Confidential, P.O. Box 99, Maidstone in Kent. And you can write to me at the same address if you'd like to talk about any sexual and emotional problem which may be troubling you. I'll be back with more straight talk about sexual and emotional matters. In the meantime, have fun, but stay safe. Good night.